This video is sponsored by Wondrio, the premier entertaining and educational video subscription service that enriches your overall life experience with approachable, comprehensive, and illuminating content. More on Wondrium later, but for now, let's get started talking about the Big Four, a quartet of massive ships often overlooked by ocean liner enthusiasts despite being the epitome of the character and business model of the famous White Star Line. While they might not have been as glamorous as the Olympic-class ships which were to follow, and not as unique and charming as Oceanic which preceded them, the Big Four are appealing and interesting for a number of other reasons, and in fact, they were arguably the most successful ships the White Star Line ever operated. White Star had, in the past, competed with other companies for speed. They had even had a few blue ribbon holders in their fleet in the past. But by the start of the 20th century, marine technology had progressed to the point where a fast transatlantic liner could make the crossing from Liverpool to New York in well under a week. In 1899, White Star received the beloved Oceanic, which offered a maximum speed of 21 knots. That speed, though, was hard-earned, at least the last few knots of it. Oceanic's predecessor, Majestic, had a top speed of 20 knots, but White Star wanted Oceanic to have a top speed of 21 knots. To achieve this, Oceanic's horsepower was 27,000, compared with Majestic's 16,000. This is a 69% increase in horsepower. Now we're not exactly comparing apples and oranges here as Oceanic was significantly larger than Majestic, but the point is that the last single knot of speed was the most costly knot out of Oceanic's 21 knots. That extra knot of speed meant additional machinery, which was not only costly in and of itself, but took up valuable space in the ship and meant that the ship had to carry more, and use more, fuel in order to compensate for that extra weight. For example, Baltic, the third ship of the Big Four, consumed only 235 tons of coal per day on her maiden voyage, compared with the 450 tons of coal used per day by the significantly smaller Oceanic. And since the steam had to be kept up by manual labor, the payroll was higher. And since width of a ship is an inhibitor to speed, Oceanic had to be quite narrow, with a 10 to 1 length to width ratio. A narrower ship, of course, meaning that there was less room for paying passengers and cargo, and more discomfort for those passengers who were on the ship, as the ship would be more prone to rolling. A high cost to pay for an extra knot of speed, right? Right. Which is why the White Star Line shifted priorities before Oceanic was even launched. Oceanic was supposed to have a sister ship, to have been called Olympic. This ship was cancelled though, and in 1898, White Star ordered from Harland and Wolf a new ship, which would lay the groundwork for White Star's 20th century business model. This new ship would become the Celtic, and she would be built from the scrap metal which had been allotted for Oceanic's sister, and White Star's old business strategy. Celtic would be a very different ship from Oceanic. For starters, she would be much bigger at just under 21,000 gross registered tons, compared with Oceanic's 17,200. More importantly though, a greater portion of the space, tonnage after all being a measure of internal volume, was usable, since less space was needed for machinery like boilers and engines. With two quadruple expansion engines powering the ship, Celtic would have space for 347 first class, 160 second class, and a whopping 2,352 third class passengers, for a grand total of 2,859 passengers. For comparison, Oceanic's original total passenger capacity was about 1,700, meaning that despite only being about 22% larger than Oceanic, Celtic could carry nearly 70% more passengers than her older fleetmate. Again, this isn't exactly comparing apples to oranges since different classes require different amounts of space, but you get the idea. On top of the passenger capacity, Celtic would have a cargo capacity of 18,500 tons. And all of the future passengers would have more public space and, theoretically, a more comfortable ride when the seas were rough. And with a design service speed of 16 knots, Celtic could cross from Liverpool to New York in just about a week, a little bit longer than the five and a half days for Oceanic. I don't know about you, but I would rather spend an extra day and a half at sea if it meant my ticket was cheaper and the journey more comfortable. But I suppose I'm biased. In fact, I'd probably prefer to stay longer. White Star got all of this in Celtic for a total construction cost of £556,442, a modest sum for a ship of her size and quality. And it seemed like White Star had itself a winning strategy. Celtic was built fairly quickly. 
Ordered at the end of 1898, her keel was laid down in March 1899, was fully framed in January of the following year, fully plated by September 1900, and finally launched on April 4th, 1901. One quick note about her construction. In order to help strengthen the ship and reduce even further the chances of vibration problems, she was to be riveted with a hydraulic riveter wherever possible, as these were stronger than rivets done by hand. This is important because vibration issues were extremely disruptive to passengers and were costly to repair, if it was even possible. Celtic was officially delivered to White Star in July 1901, and preparations were immediately made for her maiden voyage. During these preparations, Celtic was opened up to the public for a small fee, all proceeds being donated to the hospitals in Liverpool. It was a win-win for White Star, which raised £258 for charity and drummed up excitement for their new ship. Celtic departed Liverpool on her maiden voyage on July 26, 1901, at 4.30 in the afternoon. After calling at Queenstown, Ireland, she continued on to New York the following morning. She carried with her only 607 passengers, less than a third of her total capacity. But this number was similar to what could be expected on an average voyage, and because of Celtic's fuel and labor efficiency, there was plenty of room for profit at this capacity. Those in first class would have enjoyed spacious promenade and boat decks, a grand multi-deck dining saloon, popular smoking room, and an elegant and bright lounge. In the third class, passengers had simpler comforts, but comforts nonetheless. In fact, one reporter writing about the ship argued that the third class accommodations were where the Celtic shined brightest. He noted the piano in the dining saloon as being particularly noteworthy, which it was, and also pointed out the privacy afforded to married couples and families, a relatively new luxury for third and steerage class passengers on the Atlantic. Overall, the third class accommodations were simple, but decent and humane, which was a far cry from the standards only a decade or two earlier. This photograph makes it clear what allowed for the dramatically improved third class accommodations. On the left is White Star's ship, Britannic, launched in 1874, only 28 years earlier. On the right is one of the ships constituting the Big Four. The two ships were built for the same service and the same route, but a couple of decades meant that they were worlds apart during this era of rapid technological development. This particular ship is the Cedric, the second of the Big Four. Before Celtic had even been launched, Cedric's keel had been laid at Harland and Wolfe. Cedric would be largely similar to her sister Celtic, but one interesting modification is the inclusion of well-end type lifeboat davits as opposed to the bent arm type traditionally used. Cedric was one of the first liners, if not the first, to use the far superior well-end type davits. Aside from this, the only major changes to Cedric's design was a slightly larger first class dining saloon in order to accommodate the slightly increased number of first class cabins. Her maiden voyage was on February 11th, 1903, and it was a little slow at an average speed of 14.4 knots due to rough conditions. By the time of Cedric's maiden voyage, the construction of the third ship was already well underway. Baltic had been fully plated a month earlier in January 1903. Baltic was originally ordered as an exact copy of Cedric, but her design was soon modified so as to be 28 feet longer between perpendiculars, that is, between the stem and the stern post. This lengthening allowed for an even further expansion of the first-class accommodations, as well as an increase in the number of second-class cabins, although the public spaces in second class were mostly unchanged. Baltic's maiden voyage began on June 29, 1904, and the soon-to-be-famous Captain Edward J. Smith was transferred from the old Majestic to the company's new unofficial flagship. Thomas Andrews of Harlan and Wolfe was also aboard for the maiden voyage. All were very pleased with Baltic's performance. The last ship of the Big Four would have to wait a little longer. Although the keel was laid right before Baltic's launch in November 1902, the final ship would experience a number of delays throughout the building process. In the meantime, Celtic, Cedric, and Baltic were at work earning a profit for the White Star Line and recouping their building costs. Overall, this soon-to-be quartet of ships was a lucky bunch, but they weren't immune from misfortune. On Christmas Day 1905, Celtic was at sea when a massive wave struck her the wrong way, causing structural damage to the ship and flooding the first-class smoke room and staterooms. On January 23, 1909, Baltic was involved in the sinking of White Star's own ship, Republic. Luckily, Baltic was not involved in the collision itself, but rather came to Republic's aid after she was T-boned by the Italian ship Florida. But the foggy conditions which caused the collision also made it difficult for Baltic to locate her fleetmate Republic. 
Once Baltic was in the vicinity of Republic, officers of the two ships used their whistles and Marconi wireless to coordinate and ultimately locate each other. Baltic painstakingly took on Republic's passengers and ultimately left her to try to make it ashore. Eventually, though, it became clear that the Republic was doomed. Luckily, another ship named the Gresham had stuck with her in case she needed to be abandoned, and Republic's crew watched their ship go down by the stern from the safety of the Gresham. Given all the delays in the fourth ship's construction, improvements to her design were called for. These changes would make the last ship to be named Adriatic the most unique of the big four. Improvements included rearranging of some of the public rooms, in addition to the inclusion of a whole new reading and writing room, which, in my opinion, was perhaps the most beautifully decorated room on the ship. Most noteworthy, though, was the addition of an entire complex of amenities for first-class passengers down on the main deck. These included a Turkish bath, gymnasium, and swimming pool, making Adriatic the first passenger ship in the world to have a proper swimming pool. Small and bare as the pool may have been, features like these are symbolic of the transition from ocean travel being a laborious and often dreadful experience to something more like a fun journey. While the gymnasium was free to use, the Turkish bath was at an extra fee of $1, and there were separate times allotted for men and women. One more small detail that probably wasn't so small to the passengers is the transition from long tables with bolted down swivel chairs in the dining saloon to smaller, more personal tables with regular chairs. This naturally would have made passengers feel more like they're ashore than at sea. There were also some improvements to the second class, including an enlarged smoke room. Adriatic, the last of the big four, was finally launched in September 1906 and sailed on her maiden voyage in May of the following year under the command of Captain Edward J. Smith. Smith, it seemed, was moving up the ranks. Adriatic was not only the largest, but the fastest of her sisters, and achieved an average speed of over 17 knots on her maiden voyage. At 24,540 gross register tons, Adriatic was the largest of the big four sisters. But unlike her sisters, she would never have the claim to the largest ship in the world due to the long delay in her construction. Still, Adriatic was impressive, and with all four of the big four at their disposal and in service, White Star was doing quite well for itself. Between 1901 and 1907, White Star's annual profit nearly doubled, increasing from £454,000 to £848,000 over a six-year period. This success was largely due to the profitability of these four very practical and economical ships, and most of its increase cannot even be attributed to Adriatic, as she only entered service in April of 1907. Around the same time, White Star shifted much of its operations from Liverpool to Southampton, including the huge Adriatic. At the time, Southampton's harbor could barely handle a ship as large as Adriatic. White Star officials directed their employees to keep Adriatic in particular at a light draft when sailing for Southampton. The company hoped, though, that this less-than-ideal arrangement wouldn't last long, and it pressed the Southampton Harbor Board to swiftly improve the port to better accommodate its biggest ships. The necessary improvements were eventually made, no doubt because the Harbor Board recognized the necessity of doing so if it wanted to remain a viable port for the world's increasingly large merchant ships. A few years passed and White Star was getting ready to receive its largest new build since Adriatic. In 1911, Olympic was delivered to White Star. Olympic surpassed Adriatic, and not by a little bit either. Olympic was an incredible 45,000 gross register tons, the largest ship in the world by miles. Adriatic thus lost several of her officers to the new ship, including William Murdoch and Captain Edward Smith himself. A year later, and another behemoth, Titanic, sailed on her infamous maiden voyage. After she struck that cruel iceberg and signaled for assistance, Baltic was one of the ships to answer her call for help. Baltic was eastbound out of New York at the time, but she was just too far away to help. The big four were almost involved in the Titanic saga again because Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line who had survived the sinking, tried his best to get Cedric, which was in New York preparing for her return voyage to England, to stay in New York long enough to take himself and Titanic's surviving crew back to Europe and away from the inevitable chaos in America. Ismay was communicating back and forth with the International Mercantile Marine Company's vice president to this effect, but the request was denied. Cedric had a schedule to keep, and different arrangements were made for Titanic's surviving crew and officials. The Big Four had settled into a stride, and since its inception in 1901, 
the four sisters had carried a grand total of 870,000 passengers by 1914. But that stride was about to be interrupted again, because in July 1914, World War I began, and in August, Britain declared war on Germany. Cedric was westbound for New York when the declaration of war came, and she was ordered to divert to Halifax for her own safety. But when it was realized that there was no land-based transportation between Halifax and New York for her passengers, Cedric continued on her voyage, in the fog and without the use of her whistles, for safety. Nonetheless, Cedric made it to New York. While Celtic and Baltic were in Europe at the time, Adriatic was already in New York. Her return voyage was delayed, but on August 8, 1914, Adriatic was the first British ship to leave the safety of New York after the declaration of war was made. As she backed out of her pier, Adriatic was bid a safe voyage by onlookers, including the stewards aboard Olympic, who anxiously awaited their own inevitable departure. In this photograph, Adriatic's passengers waved back to their well-wishers, chanting, God save the king. Even though they were not very fast, the big four were not immune from requisition for wartime service. Celtic and Cedric were both requisitioned and put to work as armed merchant cruisers, being fitted with six-inch guns. Baltic and Adriatic, on the other hand, were allowed to continue on their commercial service, but many of their berths were reserved for military personnel throughout the war. In early 1916, Celtic and Cedric were relieved from their service as armed merchant cruisers, and were allowed to sail commercial voyages once again. But for the duration of the war, they carried mostly cargo, and White Star did not even advertise their voyages to the public. As a result, one of Adriatic's voyages carried only 12 first-class passengers. By some miracle, Celtic, Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic all survived the war. These ships, it seemed, were truly lucky. After the armistice, White Star wanted to get its service back up and running as quickly as possible, and the surviving Big Four were among the first ships to re-establish regular service on the Liverpool to New York route. The company had lost many ships during the war, including the huge Britannic, a devastating blow to the company. While the Southampton route was not in gear, the Big Four were busy repatriating Canadian troops and carrying civilians westward. By 1920, the Big Four were beginning to show their age in some ways. In January, Celtic was pulled from service to undergo some renovations in order to extend her viability as a passenger liner. Among these were significant improvements to the third class, the expansion of private bath facilities, which were becoming a hot commodity on the Atlantic by that time, and the addition of a veranda cafe at the aft end of the boat deck. I should note that the veranda cafe was open at the stern so as to allow passengers to eat and drink in the fresh air. This seems obvious, but a nice feature that is sometimes overlooked. On the Big Four, the cafe was not decorated as finely as on the Olympic-class ships. While Celtic was out of service, Cedric had an accident while leaving New York, which, after a tow back to the pier, would leave her helplessly stranded for a month while a replacement part was shipped from Liverpool. Once she was repaired and Celtic was back in service, Cedric too was pulled for similar renovations to her sister. Baltic and Adriatic were pulled subsequently. Nicely renovated, the Big Four continued in their noble duty of transporting passengers and earning a profit for their owners. Even when the United States reduced immigration numbers in the early 1920s, Celtic, Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic were still profitable ships, even with reduced bookings. But with this reduced demand for transatlantic travel, the idea of putting ships to work in the pleasure cruising market became more appealing. Adriatic was scheduled for periodic cruises beginning in the early 1920s. She sailed to warm ports of call in the Mediterranean, including places like Naples and the stunning Amalfi Coast of Italy. On the Atlantic run, Adriatic called at Boston, Massachusetts for the first time in June 1923, and that city would become an alternative destination for the Big Four on some voyages. In keeping with the times, White Star announced in August 1926 that aboard Celtic and Cedric only, first class would be redesignated as cabin class and second class as tourist third cabin or simply tourist class. Third class would remain the same. While this new arrangement was significantly more confusing, it proved popular for reasons that may be obvious, and was subsequently implemented on Baltic and Adriatic. In November 1928, Celtic was eastbound from Boston, and was scheduled to call at Cove, Ireland, recently renamed from Queenstown, but the weather was not cooperating. Since Celtic was unable to safely take on the pilot, her captain, Gilbert Berry, decided to bypass Cove and proceed directly to Liverpool. This is not something that would have been done lightly, as it would have been a great inconvenience to paying passengers, so that is how you know the conditions were actually bad. 
But the weather suddenly improved, and with 70 passengers and 750 mailbags bound for Cove, Captain Barry decided to turn back in hopes of being able to make the stop after all. But the original pilot had figured out that Celtic was skipping the port and turned in, so when the ship returned, there was no pilot to guide her in. While Celtic was awaiting for a new pilot, the weather worsened again, and Celtic had to heave to while she waited. A pilot boat finally arrived, but the weather had deteriorated to the point where he couldn't board. Moving a little closer to shore, a sudden gust of wind latched onto the ship and pushed her toward the shore. Celtic ran aground at 4.55 a.m. As passengers and crew gallantly prepared to abandon ship, the tide receded and put Celtic hard aground. Once it was determined that the ship was not in immediate danger, breakfast was announced at 6.30, an hour and a half after the grounding. While the sun rose, passengers and unnecessary crew were taken off the ship by tender. Then salvage crews got to work. Captain Charles Bartlett, former captain of Britannic and now chief marine superintendent for the White Star Line, arrived at the scene and boarded the ship with company officials and insurance representatives. Celtic was insured for £230,000, but the damage to the ship, even if they were able to get her off the rocks without sinking her, was approaching the insured amount. The ship was nearing the end of her life anyway, and the sad decision was made to abandon her. Celtic's wreck was sold for scrap, and she was slowly dismantled by daring salvagers. One of the first things to go were her funnels, because she was grounded so close to Roach's Point Lighthouse that they were obstructing the beam of light and putting other ships in danger. For the next few years, passengers and other ships, including Celtic's sisters, could witness Celtic's wreck as it was slowly dismantled. With Celtic gone, the Big Four was down to three ships. But White Star continued to use the well-known name and discreetly replaced Celtic with Albertic in advertisements. By now, the Big Four, or the Big Three, were really getting old. But they still had a little bit of life in them, and White Star even opted to do some renovations to them, including the replacement of swivel chairs in the dining saloons of Cedric and Baltic with regular chairs. These ships, it seemed, always had more profits to give to their owners. But by the early 1930s, those profits were starting to dry up. Cedric, Baltic, and Adriatic would occasionally turn a profit, but they were losing money at least as often as they were making it. White Star had just acquired the new Britannic and Georgic, which were very economical and were already earning healthy profits. They were suitable replacements for the Big Four. And so, it was the end of the line for what remained of the Big Four. With the merger between Cunard and White Star that year, Adriatic, the last of her sisters, was sold for scrap in November 1934 to a company in Japan for £45,500. The process of determining whether or not to abandon Celtic and when it was time to sell Adriatic to the scrappers are complex business decisions with a lot of moving parts. If I wanted to learn more about money and finance, basic business principles, or management, or any other topic, my first stop would be Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming service with a carefully curated library of short and long-form videos, tutorials, how-tos, and so much more. If there is a subject you want or need to learn more about, chances are that Wondrium has an authoritative yet accessible course, video, or documentary to help you learn new information and skills. Right now, I'm taking a fascinating course on the history of pirates presented by a cultural historian. My mind was blown when I learned of a well-documented pirate attack in which Julius Caesar was captured by pirates and held for ransom. Not knowing who he was, only that he looked important, the pirates demanded 20 pieces of silver for his release. Insulted by the low ransom, Caesar demanded that they raise the ransom to 50 pieces, the mark of a truly egocentric individual. I've learned a lot, and I still have 22 lectures to go in the course. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium will be your new favorite place. And they're giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Show your support for the great big move by subscribing to Wondrium. Click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Thank you for watching another episode of The Great Big Move.